Welcome to the HR Dialogues, a podcast where we talk about HR and the future of work. I'm your host, Dr. Dieter Feltzman, and we have an exciting episode lined up today where we'll be talking about the future of HR technology, what we should be doing, what we should be thinking about, and how we're going to make sure that we adapt what we do in HR to be relevant and future fit. Welcome to the HR Dialogues, where we learn from people practitioners as they navigate the emerging world of work. We've got a fantastic guest joining us today, Vinay. Welcome to the HR Dialogues. When I think about you, words that jump to mind, technologist, HR futurist, people strategist, and so many things more. But perhaps in your own world, in your own words, Vinay, who are you and what brings you to our episode today? Thanks for having me, Dieter. It's a pleasure. Uh, in my own words, who am I? Uh, I'd have to say uh, industry practitioner, uh, behavioral scientist. Um, people will call me thought leader, but ultimately, uh, I think I'm just a student of the business. And I remain humble and, and want to be that uh, probably till the end of my career. So before we jump into the topic, and it is quite an exciting one, given the times that we find ourselves in, you know, something we like to ask all our guests is what has been the best piece of advice that you have received in your career? When I got into the uh, industry, it was the dot, the dot com boom uh, mm. and things have just really accelerated. So I think back then everybody said in order to be always thinking outside the box, you always need to be learning and upskilling and keeping on top of what industry trends are. And if I think about it, not a lot has changed in that kind of uh, advice that I got. That's fantastic. I think the advice around to be continuously learning and adapting and remaining curious is probably even more relevant today than what it sounds like was when you initially kind of were confronted with that as well. Um, Vinay, why are you passionate about HR? Why do you spend your time in this beautiful profession of ours? Technology is an asset. It helps us do things, but we buy it and we use it and we we absorb it and consume it. But human capital, people, is an asset man that has to be managed, right? Which is why HCM is human capital management. Uh, and then, of course, we have infrastructure, buildings and stuff and whatnot. So ultimately, um, I'm very passionate about HR because it is the most complex. You buy a building, the building is there. Uh, you buy um, technology. Computers and whatnot, the computers are there. You, of course, you have to learn it. But the most complex thing that a, an organization deals with is human resources. And uh, I think that uh, because of that, it it poses the greatest complexities and challenges. I think that gives us a very nice introduction into the topic that we'll be talking about today, which is really this intersect between HR technologies and where we are today. We use big words like digital transformation and what that's going to look like. But really this question around, but what does it mean practically and how are we going to shift towards the future? What is on the horizon? You know, recently, generative AI has been all the talk and all the hype. Definitely think there's lots of potential for us to unpack that as well. But that's not the full picture. That's almost just what is at the forefront of the moment. And I'd love to pick your brain today in our episode on what should we be doing in the HR technology space? And, you know, what I would love us to be able to see if we go a couple of years down the road is that we've really grasped the opportunities that is on the horizon pertaining to HR technology. My personal view is I think we've missed the boat in some of the older technologies. We are still playing catch up to a large extent, but I would love your view on that. And maybe let's start out very basically with a question, Vinay, around when we talk about digital HR transformation, what does that actually mean? And give us a bit of insight around where we are today. Excellent question. Um, so first of all, when I say, when you say, what is digital transformation? For each company, it has to be different because there's no two companies that are the same. So as you just alluded to, some of the things that companies uh, maybe uh, ignored in the past, you know, they're playing catch up on, right? So if you're catching up on some of that, then you're surely not ready to go all in on digital AI first. Uh, so, and as you're, you know, but maybe your audience doesn't, is that, uh, so I'm at Oxford University and I'm studying postgraduate executive uh, AI and global business. And when the, so ultimately here's the statistics for today. If we were to look at the, all the organizations in the world, how many of them are at level five NVIDIA, Microsoft, digital AI first? 
very, very few. In fact, it's a single digit. So when we say, uh, you know, what does digital transformation look like? Um, my best uh, advice to our listeners is that don't try to say, I've got to catch, you know, uh, Elon Musk or uh, Microsoft, Google, something like that. Uh, where, where are you? And then, so instead of going from two to eight, how about you go to two to three and then three to four, maybe make something accelerated. But ultimately, uh, digital is not just pure AI. It's not like, oh my goodness, we just need everything AI. That's not the case. Um, so that's my best advice is to look at where you're at and then figure out, okay, where have we systemically been lacking? Where have we put no advancement in? And sure, we could leapfrog, but Take a look at what your digital transformation is now. And if you don't have a digital transformation, what's it going to take for you to get that? Because let's be fair, um, we could want the moon, but where's the budget? Yeah. You do raise a very interesting point, though. You know, and I sometimes find in conversations with HR professionals and clients around the world this notion. I always get asked, who can we benchmark against? That's the one thing I hear quite a lot. And then people want to know what are other people doing? And I must say, you know, things like maturity models and frameworks, I think they serve a purpose of helping you understand what is possible and where you are today. But at times we do take it slightly too far around the fact that it's not necessarily a competition between yourself and others. It's more a fit for purpose best fit solution that you should be guided as part of that. And, you know, I share your sentiment around the fact that everybody wants to be first, they want to leapfrog, they want to do new exciting things. And I think there's a place for that. But my real question is always, how, what are you solving for through your digital transformation? What are you actually trying to achieve in terms of the business problem that you're trying to resolve, you know, through your HR technology? And I must say, it sounds a little bit strange potentially coming from my side, but sometimes I find this disconnect between those two different elements. You know, something might be really novel and cool to play with, but how useful is it? It's true. We have a tendency uh, and I don't think it's an organizational, just one organization, and one leader. I think it's a culture. And it is not even a national culture. It's an international, it's a global culture in HR, right? We're all working together. And if something comes out, like when OpenAI come out, came out, it wasn't just New Jersey in the United States or United States, right? The planet got, got on board, right? So, um, but how, how effective is this brand new technology to your agenda? And so, um, I can tell you that I've worked with many, many clients who say, oh, my goodness, we need this. And then after we discuss it, they realize, yeah, I guess, you know, you just saved us an incredible amount of money. Uh, we don't need it. And in fact, not only do we or we want it, but we don't even have the capability to use it. I can't tell you how many times uh, and a senior executive will say they bought something. It wasn't what uh, it wasn't as advertised. Uh, but then on the other side, it, we bought something, but we didn't have the capabilities to actually be using it. Uh, we could use it, but we were so busy with these other things that were more pressing that we bought this extra component onto our platform and we just didn't get around to it. Uh, so we won't be using it. We won't be renewing that part next year. Um, but there's a piece of that budget that was given, right? I mean, so this, this happens, uh, routinely. And so I think uh, ultimately um, what you and I are really talking about is um, looking at current state analysis and where you want to get to in the future state, right? And do you need to, to buy all, you know, the Cadillac with all the bells and whistles or, or do you? Uh, and I think, you know, context matters, obviously, right? So, I mean, it is very much around, you know, to your point, what are we trying to solve for and what is the need that we're trying to address and what is the best fit solution for that? Because I'm also a firm believer that, it will be very different between different organizations, depending on context, depending on where they base, depending on where they find themselves in their life cycle as well. And, you know, I would sometimes be a little bit hesitant just to jump onto every single new thing. I think it is good to experiment in a controlled environment, but not necessarily throw out everything. There has to be some structure to it. I sometimes find we almost get caught and I'm going to label it, you know, MVP syndrome, where everything is always an MVP, but never a fully fledged product that we can mature over time. Um, and I do think that's something that we do need to address in terms of the mindset that we have in HR pertaining to technology and what technology is going to look like in the future. Vinay, let's shift a bit towards the question around 
when you look on the horizon with the work that you are doing, what HR tech should we be talking about? So one of them will be uh, ethical AI. Um, and so this is a human capital issue, but it's not a human capital issue just as far as it pertains to people. Uh, the data and the technology is, uh, I believe everybody in your audience, uh, as well as you and I, of course, we understand that there is a, quite a bit of bias that is developed. Uh, it is pulling from LLMs. Uh, a lot of the data in the LMs that's being pulled is bias, tainted, et cetera. It's, it might not even be real, right? It's opinionated. Um, that's why you, we are hearing, right? Uh, is it a, on a daily or a weekly basis that we hear things like uh, two lawyers cited a uh, cases in court and then the judge said, these are not real cases. And, and you know, who checked, right? So we know that. AI hallucinates and where we should by now. So there's these things that are happening. And uh, so there's this bias in AI. But then uh, more to go further with ethical, um, how much of the data that we are using is data that has been given uh, granted permission by us, right? Or was it just taken? And so we have uh, organizations that are in trouble and being sued by the United States government. And then there's uh, Europe that is uh, suing other organizations. And this is all in the front page news. So there is a number of these kinds of trust, safety, ethical, AI issues that are right now on the horizon. They're not getting solved today, tomorrow, or in the near future. Uh, and quite frankly, there are a number of laws that countries have not formulated. They're busy doing it now, some of these countries, many countries. Uh, but this is, we're all doing this at speed in real time, because quite frankly, AI, like many companies, like many technologies that are bestowed onto us, it gets put on, bestowed onto us, but we are not prepared for it. And so look at this. So that's one example. Um, I'd say another thing that we're also looking at and, uh, this is the world of human capital, right? HR, HCM, is uh, how will AI impact learning and development? Um, in many ways, our attention span has been getting shorter, 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 shorter. And it's not because of AI and it's not because of COVID. It has been for quite some time. So uh, AI does have the ability to speed up data absorption and consumption. But are we going to be getting too much data and are we actually absorbing too much? Right. It's it's economics. Uh, there is a point where, OK, the, the returns are not actually we're not getting the returns at the speed that we're getting at uh, the data at. So there's a number of things that have to be looked at. And quite frankly, that's why. AI is is here, but there needs to be even more. Talent intelligence, which is a, a new ter trend, right? Uh, term. And, and so when we have more humans that are highly educated, that have reflective strategic uh, uh, thinking skills um, and understand what the capabilities are and what they're not, how to use it and how not to use it. But I think some of the things that stand out for me, you know, and we've also found that we've recently completed some work with more than a thousand um, HR professionals to try and understand their sentiment towards some of these newer technologies is on the one side, there's a lack of confidence and sometimes competence in terms of understanding the tool sets and what they're able to do and how to utilize them. But on the other side, there's also this component around the fact that how do we take them back to the workplace and how do we go and apply them, which is much less a tool and technology conversation than one about mindset and awareness and knowing what the bigger challenges are. You know, you spoke a lot about ethics, you spoke about privacy, you spoke about intellectual property rights. Those are some real challenges that I think legislation is still catching up with. And it's almost like we are writing legislation whilst we're testing the different use cases and seeing what those things would look like around the world. A very interesting point that I want us to double click on a bit is your point around distractions. Um, I read a study recently and I can't remember the exact number, but the attention span of somebody when viewing things like digital content, for example, or listening to audio um, content, etc. And the number is so, so low that it's literally a couple of seconds before somebody moves on towards the next thing. So how do we help 
HR firstly, and then HR helped the organization in this digital domain and space to capture the minds and the imaginations and the attention of the employee, or is that really a losing battle? I'm going to answer this in, in a behavioral scientist, in a cognitive, uh, cognitive development way. I really think that when I look at the attention span and how it's gotten less and less and less, which is what you're alluding to, right? So I believe the statistics, some of the statistics that I read recently, you're talking about that, not, uh, what you just said. I read that the recruiter now reads a resume within two to five seconds. I don't know if you, you saw those statistics. So this is an issue, which means that people are not actually reading resumes, are they? I've never been able to read a resume in two seconds. Um, I, I don't, you know, so what do we do when we're doing something like that? Um, I think we have to get back to fundamentals of doing, you know, solid business. Uh, and that doesn't mean, oh, add another AI or add another platform or buy something because people's attention spans are at two seconds, two to five seconds. So uh, I think we really need to stop and look and say, wait a second, there's some things that are fundamentally now broken. Let's go back because they did work. It's not like the future is where everything works uh, and that everything in the past didn't work. That's just not true, right? But I think we also have a culture where we're like, okay, anything older as in yesterday is is no good. Only tomorrow matters. Uh, so let's speed up everything faster. Uh, I think that that's really my answer to your question is, is if we don't stop mm -hmm. to look and see where why things are broken, then we're not going to fix them. Mm -hmm. I think we have fallen into the trap in HR specifically around always want to be, you know, faster and better and more efficient. And I think that's been the behavior that we've rewarded to, you know, a, an extensive period of time. I do think in our current environment, it is worthwhile to take a step back and say, but are we spending enough of our time on the things that really do matter? And what are they? Um, you know, to your point, I mean, I think still believe, and this is maybe my assumption that I'm making or my own bias towards it. But I still believe that meetings in most organizations are underutilized and it's uh, an area and a domain that if we are able to optimize the way and the manner in which people engage with each other, that organizations will be a lot more productive and effective. And, you know, there's a whole bunch of different um, outcomes and you can also be able to tie to that. But a lot of that is really based upon the fact that nobody's ever there in the moment. They are answering this message on Teams whilst still checking WhatsApp on their phone, whilst being in a physical room with somebody else or in a meeting, while somebody else is sliding something across the desk that they do need to look at. And I know it sounds strange, but you know, you and I both know from a cognition point of view, there are limits to what you can process as a human being. And it doesn't matter how smart and how clever you are, it doesn't relate towards that. It relates towards your ability to process information within a particular context and time. So I do believe that there is work to be done around the habits and rhythms we start putting in place in organizations on how we are going to work in the future. And I love the point you make to say that, remember, the future is not where everything works necessarily. There are still some things we need to take from today that allows us to be able to shift and move into that new environment. In hearing what you were saying goes right into my answer, and that is... If a culture, if a company doesn't have strong culture dynamics, for example, let's go back to your meeting thing, right? If you're allowing everyone to come in and while they're, you know, in the meeting where half the people at minimum have their phones in their hand and somebody is, you know, at the whiteboard or, you know, on the screen doing something and presenting, um, Attention span is a, is a real issue. And so this comes down to corporate culture, leadership, and uh, these are core things that design and develop how a company operates. A company doesn't operate only through the T1 line, and so our electricity and, and our computers are up. A company operates through leadership, culture, mannerisms, and expectations. Uh, so I think a lot of this has to be done and a lot of this work has to be done. And I think we've, we've allowed for people to come and show up and there's no real rules or guardrails, right? Uh, if, if, a, if, if meetings have no structure 
and no um, rules and guidelines, uh, you're just going to allow people to do whatever they want because they don't know any better. And um, so there, I think that's one of the things that is a process that a company should go through to understand, for example, when it comes to meetings, how do we want our meetings to look like? How are we going to be get the most out of our meetings? And are we having meetings where we're not actually leaving with actionable agendas or we're kicking this into the next month's meeting or, you know what I mean? I, I bet there's so many of that, so much of that is happening. <laughs> yeah. You know, coming back a little bit towards the the topic of, you know, HR technology, what I find fascinating is you and I keep on steering and veering a little bit into, you know, behavior and skills and mindset and types of, and ways of thinking more strategically as HR professionals, when we start thinking about the HR technology future. So if I play devil's advocate, is the future of HR technology much more rooted in us changing the mindset of the HR professional and how we think about technology's role in it? I think that's too narrow. Because that has to be part of it. But HR, being that it's humans, right? So we picture this concrete building. There's lots of tech across the entire company on every single floor in every single room. And a lot of the floors have different tech. Well, it's also filled with people and people doing different functions. So when you, when you ask the question, is HR... Is it rooted in tech or, or the answer is, of course it is, right? We're always trying to get newer, uh, KPIs and data. Uh, we're trying to get, uh, platforms that actually, Hey, this was gr a great platform for us, but now we need something new. Uh, we just merged with a new company and we have three more different kinds of capabilities. These KPIs no longer cut it. So technology, of course will always be there. I mean, just imagine any company saying, well, we didn't really have to upgrade our company, our computers. We're good with the Apple II from 1980s. But the fact of the matter is the computer processing is evolving faster and faster. Well, recently, within the last six, seven years, right, we have entered a new generation and that's Gen Z. So we can't just operate the same we were in the 2000s or in the year 2010 because they weren't in our world of work, but now they are. So this is really a four-generation society. So we must evolve for a four-generation society, not a three. But there are other issues. Many companies may be targeting only Gen Z and leaving off the millennials and the Gen X and of course, boomers are still here, right? And many of them are the most executive. But if the only agenda is Gen Z and we disengage Gen X and, and millennials, what are we doing? So I think we should, we've got to be able to answer these questions in a way where we can say, yes, we are a modern society. We can walk and chew gum. And that means we need to advance our human capital agenda and our technology agenda. But quite frankly, those two may not fully answer the question of culture dynamics. And so that is a holistic organization. And when companies say, we don't need that, I mean, the numbers are staggering, aren't they, Dieter, that we haven't gotten to? Aren't the numbers staggering about productivity losses at a national and a global level? Something we've spoken about quite a bit before is, you know, the productivity paradox that even though we feel we are getting smarter, better, um, you know, faster in terms of what we are able to do, it hasn't necessarily translated back into the workplace in terms of increased productivity. I think especially in the HR domain and in the HR space to ask this question around, but the organization is a living system. It's got different parts that move together, but these parts don't move in isolation. And I love about the fact that you spoke about the fact that it's not only tech and it's not only the human capital agenda. It also has to fit into the context of, you know, culture, leadership, strategy, markets, macro environmental challenges that we also need to try and face and address. And I think that has to be a realization for the HR professional in future that to solve the problems that we will face, 
is going to require a multi-pronged, multidisciplinary type of approach that is no longer just solved by one single silver bullet. Not that it ever was, but I think there has been some impressions in the past that, you know, if we could only implement X or when system X comes in, we will be in a position to. It's a lot more complex than that. And I think it has to be a little bit more holistic um, in terms of how we address and how we we look towards the future as well. Um, Vinay, I want to turn the question around to you and ask the question, what should we be leaving behind? Because as we start moving and shifting forward, you know, and whether that is tech, whether that is current behaviors, whether that's past perceptions about who we are as HR professionals and the function, what are those things that if you gaze into your crystal ball and we speak again in five to 10 years time, we hope is no longer on the agenda that we are talking about as HR? I think that we, we've we got to be able to leave behind uh, the systemic biases that we still deal with today, right? Mm-hmm. So I'll just, uh, uh, I'll give two. How do we consider ourselves a modern society when we ha- still have an issue with this glass ceiling? Mm. How does a Vinay and a Jennifer, who are both level four senior project managers, I get a dollar and she gets 90 cents? Mm-hmm. For what? Because mm. she's a woman? This kind of a scenario is just, uh, right? This is a prehistoric. This is a legacy. This is, an, this is a, a sad uh, a, a state that these kinds of measurements are still there. Why are they there? It doesn't mm. make any sense, right? Surely uh, Father's Day just passed. What father wants to know that his daughter gets less than his son for the same job? None. No mother or father wants that. No auntie, no uncle, no grandparents. Quite frankly, we don't want it as a society because it doesn't make any sense. It didn't make sense then. It doesn't make sense today. But surely we consider ourselves a modern society, don't we? Uh, and so that's one. I'll just use another one um, or give another one, I should say. And that is age discrimination. So we have this huge discrimination that is rarely discussed and just uh, talked about. It is extremely complex, but, you know, uh, age discrimination starts in the, uh, around the world at age in, for people in their 40s. Now, in 1920, maybe 60 was, was everybody's guaranteed time to retire. But in the United States, there, we, you can retire at 62, 65, and 67. They're pushing it to 70. But how can they push it to 65 and 70? Or how does the government have that when age discrimination starts over 20 years before? This doesn't make any sense. Now, I would uh, pose this question to our audience and even to you, my friend. Um, when a person hits 40, are they no longer qualified to work? What is the purpose of, of upskilling? What is the purpose of getting certifications? What is the purpose of taking more MOOC courses? What is the purpose of learning more if we're not getting smarter? When experience, experience is always an asset, but when experience doesn't become an asset, we're in trouble. And so I believe that, and I know, right? You and I know, and we should tell our audience, artificial intelligence is not going to wipe out everybody's jobs, right? What every, what AI needs, is more data and more intelligence. And that means more people in our society that know how to work with AI. There'll be more and more people with good jobs. There's a lot of, you know, with an aging population and people working longer and due to medical advances, et cetera, I think there's a lot of discussion around us thinking very differently about careers, especially late stage careers in future. And to your point, there's also a lot of good work being done on how wisdom actually develops over time and how experience plays into that. And I think that's an important thing to realize that people in different career stages, life stages contribute differently and contribute different things. And I want to come back to our previous point to say, a couple of years time, What have we solved, uh, ideal world? What is it that we are facing today that we would have solved by that point that's no longer an issue? Well, if we're lucky, I think that we'll have a harmonious four-generation society all learning and motivating and being productive with 
each other. If all four generations can find all the good and the positives in each generation, and corporations can look at these four generations and find value in all four of these generations, corporations will make lots of, a lot more money. They'll cater to all four generations and be making products that are generating more money. Uh, and they're going to be able to solve things like some of the biggest issues of the day, right? For younger generations, like mentoring. Well, if we're not hiring or retaining our older workforce, yet we want more mentoring, it, you know, these, these things seem like it's logical, but then look at our actions. So I would hope that if our, if our, our true nature of doing right by society, by human capital, if we're truly going, if we can start to invest and focus more on human capital, just like we are with technology. I'm a very big proponent of, you know, what does meaningful work look like at an individual level, at an organizational level, and at a societal level. And as I start wrapping up for us, a couple of things that really stood out for me from our conversation today is really this intersect between where we are heading from a technology point of view and how that and human capital management is really one conversation. And we should not necessarily split it out, but look at it in a lot more in a holistic way and really start thinking about how can we utilize technology and people together to solve some of the challenges that we face today in organizations. We spoke quite extensively about the fact that productivity is really a challenge. And even though we might think that we are smarter, better, and faster today, it's not necessarily translating back into the workplace, into productivity, and to the results that we want to see. And that's a challenge for us for the future. And definitely we spoke about distractions and we spoke about how digital agility is not only about tool sets, but it's also about mindset and rhythms and habits and culture that we instill within different organizations. Vinay, thank you so much for sharing some of your thoughts and views on the HR Dialogues. If people want to know a little bit more about you, where can they follow you and where can they see the great work that you are busy with? Absolutely. Uh, LinkedIn is uh, where you'll find me, uh, as well as vinayspeaks.com. Perfect. Vinay, any last words from your side? Any last advice to HR professionals listening in? Um, what, would, what words would you like to leave them with? I'd say that uh, our best days are right ahead of us. And I think that at this moment in time, even though we've got a number of the biggest challenges that we feel are insurmountable, if we dial them back and we actually start to unify and connect and start to work more with each other, we're actually going to solve a lot more of these issues. And I, from my side, a big thank you. Thank you so much for sharing your wisdom and your perspectives and views on the HR Dialogues. And to everybody listening, please do join us for our next episode. And thank you so much for listening and taking some of the learnings from Vinay and team. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.